Father, we come to you again here on this Lord's Day to once again continue to worship you, give you the praise and honor and glory that's due you, and just, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you that we still have the freedom, at least for the moment, to be able to worship you, but we know that that door is closing soon, and it's, it's very soon, and if we don't get the right people in office, that door is going to close that much quicker. And so, Father, we pray that people's eyes be opened up. Stop voting for all these satanic liberals and people that are going out there trying to destroy your word. And, you know, I see where Canada, the idiot up there, the Satanist, the so-called prime minister, then, you know, they, they want to try to make it a crime to be a Christian. You know, and this was a nation that was, quote, founded also as it was a, quote, Christian nation. And yet today, you know, it's been socialist for a long, long, long time. But, you know, that's exactly what's going to be happening here in the United States. It's already getting that way, Lord, but it's going to come that much sooner if, if we don't start making some changes. So, Father, we pray, Lord, that people's eyes be open, especially those who profess to be Christians, because it, it amazes me how people, they say they're Christians, but they just are so blind to what's in your word and, and just go against it and so forth. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless your servant. Give me the words to speak for the service. Just give me a proper understanding to teach the people and as we continue our study in Revelation. And again, as every every week I say this, but it, it's so true because it's just every week we just get that much closer to the events that are going to be happening here. Well, we see if you're just paying attention to any kind of the news, as I just mentioned, even like the thing in Canada, then things are getting so much in shape for preparing the world for the Antichrist to come that they're, they're so anti-God, most of the world today, that they'll easily accept the Antichrist because they just do not want God no matter what. They'll, they'll take anybody as long as as long as long um, they don't have to deal with God. So, Father, we just pray that you'll open the eyes of people, that Christians might get bold to go out and try to win souls for you before it's too late because that door is going to close one of these days. And it's going to be very hard for people to try to get saved. So, Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service, be with each and every one, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study in Revelation. This will be Revelation part 56. Now, we've been looking at Revelation chapter 8, and we uh, finished up the seven seal judgments, and now we started looking at the seven trumpet judgments. When we looked at the first trumpet judgment last week, you know, I said that, you know, God had these seven angels with the trumpets prepared. He was going to allow them to assist him now, where Jesus did the seal judgments himself. Now the trumpet and the vial judgments, then God will use angels to uh, open them or not open them up, but to bring them forth. And we saw how, I mentioned how the first angel, when it sounded, then there fouled hail. And this is verse 7, chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there fouled hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up. And all green grass was burnt up. And I mentioned how, you know, all the devastation that that, that first trumpet judgment was going to cause. You know, we're not going to get into all that again, but I do want to mention again that how we're going to see that some of these trumpet and vile judgments, so there's going to be a total of, of five actually all together out of the, those 14 that have very much similarity or you know, basically the same thing, but on a much grander scale as the 10 plagues that we saw that, that God uh, put upon Egypt that you know, they're basically the same, but now instead of just being on Egypt, they're going to be on a worldwide scale. So they're going to be a much more, you know, far worse than what was with Egypt. But yet, you know, and, and we said that, you know, Jesus doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, you know, we said that Egypt, you know, Pharaoh was a type of Antichrist. And Egypt, in one sense, was kind of a type of of the things that were going to go on with the, with the world. I mean, you know, it's kind of like in one sense, it was a type of the tribulation. You had Pharaoh as the Antichrist, and you had the, um, how basically the Egyptians, the, you know, they were the world, how, how they had rejected Jesus. 
And so, you know, in one sense, it was a type of the future tribulation. And then these judgments coming upon them by God is a direct uh, type of what's going to happen in the tribulation. When God brings this judgment, you know, we've got 21 judgments he's going to bring upon the world. That's going to, you know, show God his glory. Because remember, I said that the judgments there in Egypt, the 10 plagues, were judgments upon the gods of Egypt. You know, remember they had all these different gods, you know, the sun god, they had the uh, river god, you know, the moon god, whatever, all these different ones. And so God brought judgments upon them, you know, and Pharaoh himself was considered a god. And that was why the last judgment was and it took, you know, the firstborn son. And, you know, basically, you know, Israel was God's firstborn son. And so, you know, that's what, you know, when he was trying to keep, from you know, allowing Israelites to go. And God's like, you mess with my firstborn, I'm going to mess with your first, firstborn. And it was to show again his power that, you know, that these, these gods were supposed to be able to, you know, the, the, the sun, you know, they had the sun God. Well, God darkened the sun for a while. You know, we're going to see that later on as one of the judgments. Again, in the tribulation, you know, they had the, they had a frog God. Well, Next thing you know, they had frogs everywhere, places, I mean, in their beds, everywhere else. I mean, they're just heaps of them. It showed again that, you know, that their, their gods, you know, they can't heal things or they can't do this. They can't do that. They couldn't take care of their, you know, he's supposed to be Pharaoh's God, but yeah, he couldn't even keep his own son alive and things like that. So, you know, all these judgments were, were that. And so, again, all these things, I believe, were just a type of what was going on. So it's not necessarily a coincidence or like, why would God repeat these things? Is because, you know, now God's just, you know, he doesn't change. He's just doing the same thing again. Because, again, that was a type of, just like we mentioned in Daniel, about how the fiery furnace was a type of hell. Then all these things, you know, they're done for, for like that for a reason. So, you know, I mean, I know some people may disagree with me, but I believe that that's, that's the truth. So, you know, I think the, it, it's important we keep those things in mind as we start looking at the rest of the trumpet and vile judgments that we'll see the connection there with Egypt, you know, I'll bring up some of it, but again, just keep in mind that those were judgments against the gods of Egypt. And, you know, that's really also what the tribulation is. The tribulation is also because God's tired of man and he's, you know, bringing his wrath upon him. And he's trying to wake them up, but it's also in one sense, punishment against Satan and his angels, you know, that he's let him run the world but now he's going to show them, you know, basically, ultimately, you know, who's in charge. You know, who's going to, when Jesus comes back at the end, what's he do? He casts, you know, uh, Satan gets thrown into the to the pit for a thousand years, and the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And, you know, it doesn't say, but I'm quite sure that his uh, angels that are helping him out and stuff get cast in there as well. And, you know, but we're going to see that, you know, in one sense, remember, they're the gods, you know, Satan's called the god of this world. You know, and the, and the little G, you know, all, all the, the devils and stuff. It says that idols, they have, a, they have you know, devils behind them. And, and, you know, they're all referred to as little G gods, you know, that God calls them all. You know, so in one sense, again, it's, the tribulation is also judgment, just like in Egypt against those false gods, which, again, really were nothing more than devils and their idols. You know, that, that they were devils behind them. That, that same judgment is not only on man on the earth, but it's also going to be against in one sense, the God of this world and, you know, the false gods of this world as well. So, but we also saw, as I said, how that, um, like with the fire, you know, the fire and water are used, you know, they had fire and hail in that first judgment. And now I mentioned how fire and water are both cleansing agents, you know, fire can be destructive, but it could also be a cleansing agent. And so is water, but water can also be destructive, but, and I mentioned how I said there's going to be five times where there's five judgments in the tribulation that are the same that match up with Egypt. And I mentioned how that the number five in this case means death. Now, it can also mean grace and so forth, but in this case, it means death. And, you know, in one sense, it still also means grace and the fact that he's, you know, by his grace, he's even allowing you guys that he could just wipe everybody out. But even as bad as things are during that, that that tribulation, that seven-year period, there's still going to be a lot of people that we're going to get saved. You know, we saw that in the previous chapter, how there's so many people that get martyred, but, you know, people from all languages, tongues, nations, and so forth, tribes, are going to get, are still going to get saved, you know, so there's still going to be a, 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 grass, a great number, a great revival, where a great number of people are going to get saved, even though most of the world's going to reject God, 
there's still a lot to get saved. So, you know, in that sense, there's that grace, but it's also the death. So, you know, kind of has both means. But let's pick it up in Revelation chapter 8, verses, look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to look at the second trumpet. So, Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now remember, I mentioned this last week, but the, the uh, trumpet judgments, a lot of them are in thirds. You know, the judgment is on a third of this, a third of that. Like we saw in um, the first one, where it says, you know, that the, the hail and fire was came upon the earth, cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass burnt up. So, you know, I had the third part of trees and so forth. Then we see uh, here, it's going to be a third part of the sea became blood, a third part of the creatures were destroyed, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. So, you know, keep that in mind, too, with the trumpet judgments that we'll have that one third. Now, again, I said, you know, maybe that one third has to do with, you know, there was one third of the angels that rebelled with Satan. It became the fallen angel, the evil angels. You know, that's why the, the Freemasons have 33 degrees. You know, it represents the one third of Satan, you know, the, uh, the angels that fell. And. So, you know, I mean, Scripture doesn't say for sure. I don't know exactly why, you know, if it has to do that or it has to do with the number three being representing the Godhead or something like that. It's showing you this is the Godhead's vengeance on the earth or whatever. But, you know, it could be a combination of the two. But I do I do think there's probably some type of significance there, especially when, you know, the trump, trumpet judgments continue that pattern of, of a third of this, a third of that and so forth. But, you know, just keep that in mind. So a second angel sounds, and a great mountain burning with fire is cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea becomes blood. Now the great mountain described here is possibly a great meteorite that is still burning as it goes through the atmosphere, or it could simply be a mountain cast from heaven by God, just like he cast fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain around them. Remember, he destroyed those five cities or whatever. Now, it also could be a mountain near the sea, maybe on the island that God has break off and fallen to the sea, though this is probably not the case since it says the great mountain is cast into the sea and not falls into the sea. You know, so my, my vision of it is at least that, you know, it's not like a mountain that was on the edge. It just fell off. You know, remember the the... In New Hampshire, they had what they call the the man in the the face of the mountain, a man in the mountain, or whatever, and whatever it was, I don't know, fifteen years ago or something. It's been a while. Then the, the face of it just kind of off, eroded away and, and fell off. So it's not there anymore. You know, there's different places where things like that have happened. Now, obviously, that's not a mountain. That was just you know a little piece. But my point is, I don't think it's something like that where it just kind of falls off. It's going to be something. It would be like, say, the Rock of Gibraltar, where it just kind of falls over and falls in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. I think it's something that it's going to be, be like, you know, like heaven, God from heaven, he's throwing, a, you know, a rock, but he's throwing a mountain or something down, you know, there's some kind of, you know, so whether it's like a literal mountain that he does something, or it's referring to a meteorite that, um, you know, obviously meteorites are big giant rocks that come from space. It, uh, you know, they start out as meteors and then, you know, it's when they hit the ground and they change the name to meteorite. But as they're coming through the atmosphere because of the heat and stuff, as they're burning up, you know, they, they, they create so much heat coming through the atmosphere, then it, they start burning up. That's why they, they have all these flames that come out. You know, that's why the space shuttle, like when it came through, had to have all those heat seals because it produces all this heat and flames literally come off on the side. And, and, and you can see that, you know, there's images of them when these meteorites come through. That's why you see them like the, the flames coming off them and you can see them, you know, at night when you have some of those meteor showers and so forth. But it could be one of those continues to burn 
as it hits the earth. <clears throat> you know, usually they're kind of, you know, the fire is out by the time it hits and then it's just, you know, real hot rock or something, but it's not necessarily burning. Now, whatever it is, it just could be something plain supernatural or something like that. But, um, but this meteor or whatever it is, as well as the one in the third judgment, might be part of a much greater storm than that from the hail and fire seen in the first trumpet judgment, as now we get a great meteor shower from space, whereas hail comes from clouds. You know, hail develops in clouds. Yeah, that's where, where it comes from. You know, scripture talks about that and so forth. So then, then it falls down. But as I said, these meteors become from space. You know, and it could be some way of, you know, like a big meteor shower can come through. Like I said, we have those. There's, called, there's one that's, uh, can't think of the name of it now, but it's the, there's a big meteor shower that happens every year. And, you know, you can time it and so forth. And, you know, but... They basically just kind of burn out their little rocks, whatever they burn up, and they don't really affect the earth. But it could be one of these things that there's another one or something a lot worse. You know, maybe a bunch of the asteroids all start heading this way. God starts sending them, and then, you know, there's so many of them that they start coming through or something. So, you know, and then one big giant one gets through. You know, whatever, whatever it is, that something's going to be coming from God's judgment. Now, I've seen theologians who claim this great mountain refers to a fallen warrior nation. But I disagree and believe we need to take God at his word here. You know, so I, I don't, you know, like I said, there's a lot of these theologians that they always got to come up with something that, well, it really means this, it really means that, you know, and again, I'm not saying it's a, it's a meteor or whatever it is. You know, it could be some type of literal mountain. It could be whatever, something that God does supernaturally, whatever. I don't know. You know, an angel comes along and picks up Mount Everest and throws it in the water. I mean, an angel could do that or whatever God wanted him to. So, you know, remember he told, Jesus himself told his disciples, if you had faith, it's, it's the seed of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed. So it's not even like it's some big faith. I mean, this little tiny faith. He's like, you could move that mountain and cast it into the sea. Well, it might be something literally like that. So it might be an actual literal mountain, but he has an angel, as I said, take one of the mountains, you know, like Mount Everest or something. And he picks it up, you know, like takes his hand. It's like he's scooping it out of the earth and then cast it into the ocean, you know, the sea. You know, I don't know what, but I mean, whatever it is, it's something, you know, like that. But I just, you know, I, I do not believe it's some warrior nation. It's, it's going to be, a you know, coming on here. Because again, it says nothing about that. We need to take it literally. It's talking about a mountain. It's talking about the sea and so forth. You know, that's not talking about this mass invasion by this warrior nation or something. I mean, again, it's just people trying to twist God's word or make it so that, you know, they don't want to believe that these things could be real or, or something like that. So I don't buy into any of that at all, but I just, I don't even like to point some of those things out, but I just know that people probably read some of these things. And I just want you to know that, you know, that that's just false teaching. So, but the sea would be full of people on ships as well as animal life. And the mountain striking them could kill all of them and their blood. Could be why the sea is blood or it could be uh, from something else. You know, so it says in here, uh, on the end of verse 8, And the third part of the sea became blood. So, you know, again, it could be something has nothing to do with this or it could be from just all the people that are going to be getting killed and the animals that are going to be getting killed in the, in the sea that obviously they get, you get a bunch of them, they're going to start bleeding and, you know, you're going to have blood all over the sea. And don't take long for water. You go and put a couple of drops in. You want, you know, like shark episodes or something, you know, shark week or something. You know, they, they put a couple of drops of water in and it doesn't take long and it'll start dispersing. And, you know, then you got like this whole area, you know, this big puddle that's all red from the blood. So it doesn't take even a lot that you go and you can make the whole thing look as like it's, it's, um, all blood or whatever. Now, many theologians claim the sea in this verse is referring only to the Mediterranean Sea near Israel. Now, this sea is always full of ships. Even the U.S. Navy has the sixth fleet anchored there. You know, it's our main fleet over there that, you know, we're, we're there. You know, you hear about all the stuff going on with Israel right now. We always have the ships there for, you know, they're nearby for Italy and, 
uh, anything that's going on in Europe and so forth. And so, you know, it's called the Sixth Fleet. That's our main fleet that's over there. So, excuse me, it's not even just European nations, whatever. I mean, it's nations all over the world. You know, the United States has ships there and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of ships. The Mediterranean is very, very busy sea. You know, there's a lot of shipping and things that go on. But now, while this may be true, I believe the word sea here is used of the seven seas. It represents all of the oceans when compared to verse 10. You know, we're going to we'll look at that here in a minute, but well, I don't know if we'll get to it or not, but uh, I'll read it in a second. But the, uh, you know, again, I, I think it's people trying to minimize things. And I do understand that a lot of times things in Scripture relate to Israel. And, you know, like if you talk a direction, you say something east or west or north or south. It's in relation to uh, Israel, specifically even just Jerusalem. And, you know, obviously the Mediterranean Sea is on the, the western border of Israel. You know, you, you look at Israel now, you know, that, that there's the Mediterranean Sea right there. But I don't think that it's just referring to the Mediterranean Sea. First of all, I think God would have said it because there's other places in Scripture where he calls it the Great Sea or things like that, you know, so which refers to the Mediterranean Sea. So he would I think he would have said you know, that way we'd have known it's just talking about that one and not, but because because we're going to see here that it's going to refer, you know, these judgments are for the world. I'll read verse 10, just because I don't think we'll have time to get there. We'll read it again next week. But verse 10, and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. So the point is here that this one here falls upon the third part of the rivers. The other one was a, says the third part of the sea. So if one is affecting all, you know, it's not just one river, it's affecting a whole bunch of rivers, not just the river in Israel or the river nearby or in Europe or something. Why would the sea be any different? Because remember, in God's eyes, you know, there's the sea. Now, when there's other places, he'll divide it up into what we call the seven seas, that's your, you know, your five main oceans and then the North and South Pacific and North and South Atlantic. That's why you get your seven. But, you know, they're, you know, in one sense, they're all one sea. They're all connected. Now, they are different in the sense the way the currents, currents are and things like that. And that's why we separate them and so forth. But, you know, in one sense, they're all connected. So, you know, God can refer to them as the sea or as the seas. And so I believe here that he's referring to, you know, all the world. But also, as I just said, the tribulation is a worldwide event and not just a local one around Israel. And God is punishing all people of the world and not just those in the Mediterranean Sea. And as I said, I do understand all directions of Scripture are in relation to Israel, but I do not believe sea here does. You know, there's nowhere in here where it just says, And the angel sounded as were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And, it, and the third part of the sea became blood. You know, it doesn't say a thing in there about any direction. So it's not as though we're talking about the, the sea that's west of Israel or something or things like that. To, you know, again, it's not just this punishment is not just on Europe. It's not just on Israel. Or it's not just on whatever, you know, that area, the Middle East or something. It's, it's a worldwide judgment. So again, this is referring to all the oceans, you know, the people in the United States on the Atlantic coast and the, and the Pacific coast and so forth would be affected. I mean, these aren't just, you know, over on Australia or whatever. So that it doesn't matter in which hemisphere, if you're in the Northern hemisphere or the Southern hemisphere, you know, so. And I mentioned this a while ago, but as I said, elsewhere in scripture, the Mediterranean Sea is called the Great Sea. And I think God would have done the same here if he wanted to understand be understood for sea to only refer to it, but I believe sea here refers to all the world's oceans. You know, so why would God not just call it the great sea then? Again, if, if, if he wanted us to understand it to be the, the Mediterranean Sea. And we see in verse 9 how a third of all marine life is killed off, or creatures in the sea, as it says. It says in verse 9, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And then we see the third part of the ships are destroyed. Now, this would include fish, marine mammals, marine reptiles, crustaceans, and other sea creatures. You know, all these, you know, all these different uh, sea animals. And again, we talked about that this morning. 
it, we classify them in different things, you know, like fish, you know, there's the marine reptiles, like, you know, you have your sea turtles and so forth. And then you have marine mammals, you know, your dolphins, your whales and things like that. All these things would be, you know, we may classify them as something else, but, you know, again, God is just the marine animals, you know, marine creatures. And so all these things that live in the sea, you know, lobsters, that's your crustaceans and that type of stuff. You know, crabs, whatever, all these things, all, you know, one third of them is going to be destroyed. So from sharks to giant whales to the small plankton, which is necessary for sea life to survive, as they are the beginning of the food chain, a third will all die. You know, plankton are the really tiny microscopic animals that the the ball, uh, baleen whales and the, and the sharks, you know, they're like the blue whale, it comes in, they, they gulp up the water and they strain it through these uh, strainers and other animals eat it stuff. And it's all microscopic, you know, it just, it's on the surface of the water. So they eat that and then another animal comes along and eats that animal and then another animal bigger and eats that animal and so forth. And then you get to the top of the food chain like the sharks and so forth. Then, but so it doesn't matter, you know, if it's that or the biggest blue whale that's, you know, over a hundred feet long and over a hundred tons, one third of all these animals are going to die off, you know. So it's, it, God's not particular on whether it's a microscopic animal or whether it's just giant largest one that ever lived. Now, if a third of the sea became blood, this would kill all, this would kill off all marine life that came in contact with it as the water would lose the oxygen needed for life. The stench from a third of marine life being dead would be unbearable and would bring great disease. You know, they have what they call um, red algae that sometimes gets in the water and it looks like the water's blood. And, and it takes, it removes the oxygen. So animals, you know, sharks and different things and stuff, they cannot survive there. You know, that's why fish and things will die because even though they're in the water, animal, they still need oxygen. They just take the oxygen from the water, whereas we take oxygen from the air. You know, these animals, they still need the oxygen. So, you know, that blood removes it. And that's what would happen here. That, all, you know, once you get the, the water all turns to blood, one third of these animals, that's why they're all going to die off because they, they cannot breathe. You know, and you can only imagine the stench. You know, uh, think of when, when large quantities of fish die in oil spills and wash ashore, how devastating to the environment that is. And here, this will be a much grander scale with animals of all sizes. You know, just like they had the frogs that heaped up in um, there in Egypt during the plagues. They talk about the stench. It describes the stench. I mean, you, you get dead animals, they start decaying. I mean, just think of one dead animal in the woods or something. How much it smells, you know, roadkill or something. Here you're going to have, I mean, a whole ocean full of, you know, one third of it's all going to, you know, be dead off. So, I mean, just think of that. You know, not only, but like, again, the, the environmental disasters of all these dead animals. You know, you get it now where you'll get a school of whales or something will wash up on the, on the beach or different things like that. And, and just the diseases and things that go along with all that. Now, verse 9 also says a third part of the ships are destroyed. Now, think of all the ships traversing the oceans today and how greatly this would impact society. Now, I think we'll continue this next week. But we're about out of time here. But, uh, you know, we'll look at the the ships being destroyed and so forth like that. But, you know, like I said, just think about some of these things. You know, people kind of just skim over these things. Yeah, a third of the, the, the creatures died. A third of the ships destroyed, whatever. But they don't really think about what effect that really has. You know, I mean, you, you, you start, like I said, you start thinking about all these animals being dead and stuff and, and what kind of disaster that would bring. You know, we have uh, disasters today and they're on minor scale compared to what's going to happen here and, and the devastation and things that that does bring. So we'll continue looking at this next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to study your word in Revelation. And I do pray, Lord, that people's eyes would be opened up to not only believe what your word says, but also to just not just skim over, but to really absorb it and realize how awful these judgments are going to be during the tribulation so that if they're not saved, today is that day of salvation. They need to get saved today because 
You don't want to be going through that tribulation. Excuse me, it's going to be an awful, awful time. And it's, um, you know, a person doesn't want to be spending eternity in the lake of fire. So today is that day. They must ask Jesus to save them. So, Father, I just pray that you'll be with each and every one of us. Give us a good week and just bless us with sunshine and allow us to get the things done that need to get done and just uh, have a safe return for the midweek service. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll protect us all, keep us all healthy and safe, put a hedge around us. And just, Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to go out there and to witness for you and to try to win souls in whatever way it is, whether it's through a ministry, through books, through tracks, through uh, YouTube videos, or whatever it is that you you uh, give person to town for, music or something, then that they'll use those things to try to win souls. And Father, we just ask that you look after again each one of us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.